Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session, allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press, including this lecture, are made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Help us to help humanity by making a donation. Telema Press is a non-profit corporation. Donations are tax-deductible. For more information, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Anthropogenesis, human races and sub-races of our planet Earth. This lecture <coughs> is related with the law of the Epta Paraparshinok, the law of seven, which is the law that organizes everything in the universe is organized by the intelligence of the logos as in the previous lecture the speaker were explaining about the involution of the spirit into the matter through the Maha Mambantara or the great cosmic day in which seven Mambantaras or seven cosmic days occur. We are, according to this uh, Mahamambantara, or Great Cosmic Day, we are in the fourth cosmic day, which is called the terrestrial epoch. Usually, these uh, cosmic days are called rounds. That's why we refer sometimes to uh, cosmic rounds. So, we are in the fourth cosmic round. Previously to our present cosmic day or, or fourth round terrestrial epoch, there were three cosmic days which are related to the moon, sun and Saturn Kabbalistically. And that the Master Samael on Veor explained in detail. He explains in detail uh, about these rounds or epochs in the Revolution of Belzebub. And uh, we have to comprehend that every round or cosmic day recapitulates the previous manifestations in order to uh, express its own round. So we will say before 
any cosmic day to express its own nature, it has to recapitulate or to express in a recapitulative way the previous manifestations. This is how we understand this in Gnosticism. <coughs> and this is how we have to comprehend also that these uh, phenomena related with the cosmic manifestations of the earth and its races manifests or re is reflected in the human nature. Because remember that it is written that the human being is a microcosmos of the macrocosmos. So, when the human being uh, emerges from uh, creation, this uh, entity has to reflect in itself the previous manifestations and also manifest the future manifestations. That is what we call initiation. So, when we talk about uh, the present cosmic day, we have to refer to the book of Genesis in the Bible, written by Moses, in which he describes in detail, Kabbalistically, alchemistically, the origin of this present terrestrial epoch. And uh, <coughs> also, uh, in the book of Genesis, Moses uh, shows the way in which we can develop that in our own human nature in order to become a microcosmos, or what in Kabbalah is called the Sawirampin, which is a lesser countenance or the sa, uh, Arikampin, the great continents. So, in order for us to verify what is written in Genesis, we had to become alchemists. That's why the failure of uh, many scholars that want to interpret Genesis in the, at the dead letter, they fail because they are not alchemists. Remember that we always state that every symbol is always interpreted in seven ways. We were given several ways of interpretation to the book of Genesis in relation with the law of seven, the Eptaparaparshinok. If the reader ignores the law of seven and the law of three, the triamatsikamno law, the reader will fail in the interpretation of the book of Genesis. Moreover, if the reader is not a practitioner of the science of alchemy, he will, he will also fail in the interpretation. Because it is directly related, the book of Genesis, with the micro and the macro. And of course, we also have to develop superior senses in order to penetrate into the superior dimensions. Or in order to bring what uh, we explain in different lectures, the messages or the knowledge, the wisdom of our own particular being, which is directly related with the micro and the macro creation. So, this terrestrial epoch, as I said, was synthesized 
by uh, uh, Moses in the first uh, verses of the Bible when he says that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Of course, the right translation is Elohim. Because in Hebrew, Elim or Elohim means gods and goddesses. And this Elohim, as you see, for instance, in the Tree of Life, you find that Elohim Sabaot is a name given to the Sephirah Netzah, which we explain in different lectures, is related with the mind. Netzah, of course, is directly related with Saturn. Since Saturn governs the world of Yetzirah, because Saturn is related with Bina, the Holy Spirit. So when we were studying Netzah, we find the origin, the beginning of this Mahamantara in the mental plane. As the Master explains in the book, The Revolution of Belzebub, in the mental plane, where, uh, where it was where the races or the Eptaparapashinok started to develop in the mental plane with the human beings, what they call the Arcadia. Of course, Genesis recapitulate that cosmic day in the very beginning of the verses. When Moses says that in the beginning the, God, uh, the Elohim, which is referring in this case to these uh, monads that serialize themselves at that epoch. The Elohim created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and empty. That was what we call the protoplasmic state of our present planet earth. Or as the master explains in the book of Belzebub, the way in which the planet was coming from the nebula. The nebula, of course, Contains all the elements, but in the protoplasmic state. And uh, the book of Genesis states the spirit of the Elohim, or the Ruach Elohim, was floating upon the face of the waters. That water, of course, is the Akasha, the pure Akasha, from the superior dimensions. In no way uh, can we find in this present epoch uh, remnants of that type of matter that was in the beginning. There are worlds, there are planets in the protoplasmic state. And within that planet, in the protoplasmic state, where were the first root rays of our planet Earth, in this present terrestrial epoch, existed. Many times we, call, uh, we talk about the protoplasmic root rays that existed. Of course, with its superior dimensions, a type of matter that is not physical or three-dimensional. Because I repeat, it just wa was just the recapitulation of that epoch. The beings that existed within that protoplasmic uh, root race 
were human beings in the complete sense of the word. Meaning that hum, as you know, is a word that means spirit. And manas, man, is a mind. Individuals whose mind was controlled by their own particular monad or spirit. We will say it in complete uh, uh, Sanskrit terms. Bodhisattvas. Vehicles of superior beings that became masters in previous cosmic days. That's why uh, at that epoch they were not intellectual animals, only human beings. And uh, as we explained in different lectures, the type of matter, protoplasmic, that they were uh, having in their bodies uh, was uh, elastic or uh, ductile. They had the power of becoming small to shrink themselves to the size of an atom or to enlarge themselves to even touch the moon. Things that for us is, of course, impossible. But, of course, they were not existing in this three-dimensional world, but in the superior worlds of nature. And they were just a recapitulation, I repeat, of the Saturnian epoch. That's the beginning of this Mahamambantara, which uh, I repeat, in order to comprehend this lecture better, it is good that each one of us study the revolution of Belzebub, where the master Samael Onveor explains that in detail, but always need to be meditated, because it's something beyond our physical uh, comprehension. So, it is stated that, that uh, the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. And if we associate that to our present human level, or humanoid level, we will say that uh, we are in a protoplasmic state. Many times we, we speak that we have a protoplasmic bodies. Of course, those uh, protoplasmic bodies are not of the same nature that the protoplasmic bodies of the uh, first root race because they were created by the power of the Logos and they were masters. They were solar. But the protoplasmic bodies that we have internally as ego are lunar. <coughs> so, we have, of course, in our sexual glands, that uh, spirit of the Elohim, as we said in many lectures, that is hovering upon the face of our waters, sexual waters. Because if above we find the Akasha, the superior waters of Genesis, below here in our physical body, we find the same Akasha in our semen, in our sexual matter, where the energy of the spirit of the Elohim, which is called the Holy Spirit, floats, hoovers. It depends on us. If we transmute that, and then we create, of course, internally, uh, as we call the angel. The angel is being born within. That's why the book of Genesis, continuing in the narration of this cosmic uh, creation, states that the Elohim said, through that Ruach Elohim that was hovering on the waters of Genesis, let there be light. And the light was. That light, written there in the book of Genesis, is referring to the second epoch, or the second root race that appeared 
in a lower dimension, but always in the interior superior dimensions of our planet Earth. And that is refer referred to the root race called the Hyperboreans. Hyperboreans, or those uh, uh, people beyond the north wind. This uh, Hyperborean root race was a recapitulation of the solar epoch. Most of the beings that were incarnated at that epoch were archangels. Remember that the archangels were the outcome of the solar epoch, of the second Mambantara, of this great Mahamambantara that we are explaining here. So, the polar race, or protoplasmic race, the first root race, and the second, the Hyperboreans, are those races that we refer as androgynous beings whose bodies were of course having the two polarities creative polarities of sexual forces in one body <coughs> the sex, sexes were not of course uh, separated they were one and uh, it referred of course as that uh, root race that existed in the superior dimensions of nature. Also, we have to state that we cannot find remnants of this root race in this physical world because these uh, root races were existing in the superior dimensions, fourth and fifth dimensions of nature. So, the masters talk about them in different uh, books written, not only in the book of uh, Genesis, in the Bible, of course, we find uh, references to those races in the scriptures of Anahuac and many other uh, sacred books of ancient people. If we refer to the Bible always, it's because it is the book that is more known and uh, studied by this present humanity in the Western world. But... Uh, there's a lot of information about these races in other books. As I said, if we investigate, we find them. So, this will is what uh, uh, in Kabbalah we call Adam Kadmon. A being, of course, that was not uh, uh, three-dimensional yet. But these beings existed. And of course they had their civilizations. And were in contact with other humanities of other planets. Because we have to understand that humanities exist not only in the three-dimensional world. But also in the superior worlds. Civilizations exist not only in three-dimensional worlds but in the superior worlds as well. That's why uh, technologies of this type of humanities travel in the space and time dimensions. Something that is uh, uh, for us only credible or shown in the movies as something incredible. So, when the book of Genesis talks about dividing the waters from the waters in order for the dry land to appear,
is referring, of course, to the beginning of the Lemurian epoch, or the third root race, that was the recapitulation of the lunar round, of the lunar epoch, of the third cosmic day. Because remember that the earth has to recapitulate first in order to give birth its own nature, its own round, its own properties of the present cosmic day. So, of course, the first, the second, and the third root races that existed in the planet Earth in the beginning were the recapitulations of past manifestations in the superior dimensions. So the Lemurian root race existed in the first continent that appeared three-dimensional in this planet Earth. That is what the Bible called the terrestrial paradise where Jehovah Elohim placed the human being that he created. Of course, when you find in the Bible that Jehovah Elohim is creating uh, the human being according to his own image, to his own likeness, is precisely the way in which the Bible explains how that Lemurian race created at the image of the Elohim were crystallizing little by little into the terrestrial paradise called Eden by the Bible. Or the first dry land that appeared from that planet that was crystallizing from the Akashic waters of the space, what in Kabbalah is called Shamayim, the igneous waters. So there is where we find that uh, gigantic root race, hermaphrodites, which the Bible called the Nephilim, or giants that existed in the beginning in this planet. They were the Lemurians. We refer to the Lemurians as the hermaphrodites, not androgynous, but hermaphrodites, which means individuals that were showing the two polarities, feminine and masculine, or the two previous races, or androgynous races, in the physical body, three-dimensional body, which we will say was like semi-ethereal, semi-physical, between the third and the fourth, because they were like, we will say, descending from the fourth dimension into the third, little by little. So, the Lemurians is what uh, the Bible refers as Adam, made into the image of God, physically, or made from the dust of the earth, cosmically speaking. Of course, the dust is referred to the plasma or protoplasmic elements that were crystallizing from the superior dimensions. So, there were, of course, millions of Lemurians, or Nephilim, as the Bible talks about, giant hermaphrodites that appeared physically having both sexes or both sexual organs. So here is precisely what uh, the Bible continues explaining and that we explain in different lectures about the division of sexes 
that occurred after the fourth sub-race of the Lemurian epoch. At that time, which was in that terrestrial paradise submerged within the fourth dimension in Eden, as the Bible talks about, humanity was, of course, guided by the Elohim. They were in contact with the Elohim. Master Samael Umveor stated that uh, this root race uh, was no different from the animals, physically speaking, in the sense, of course, that internally they were in contact, as the animals are in contact with their own particular monad. So these beings, the Lemurians, have their physical bodies, as the animals have their physical bodies, divided in sexes. But the difference between the animals and the Lemurians that were, or was, that they didn't fornicate. When they were separated in sexes, the inner Elohim and the Elohim and the archangels in that epoch, that that we call Kumaras, or divine kings of nature, were guiding them and teaching them white tantrism. Because when the race was divided in Adam and Eve, or as we say, Adam Hava, the sexual act was necessary in order to keep with the multiplication of that race. Because when they were hermaphrodites, it was not necessary, the sexual act, in order to multiply the species. So, the man-woman, or the hermaphrodite being, was fecundating himself, or itself, by himself from his own uh, testicles, the sperm was fecundating the ovum in his own ovaries. A process, of course, unknown from this uh, present epoch. And they were bringing children into the world without pain. So, the father-mother was given birth. The hermaphrodite creatures. And the hermaphrodite baby was feeding itself from the breasts of the hermaphrodite. Or the father-mother at the same time. That was the way that Lemurians multiplied in the beginning. But when the sexes were divided, and then the male, which is called Adam, because the male retained the name Adam, and the female retained the other name Hava, which is Eve. So Eve retained the ovums, and the male the sperms, or the ova. What is said they are the ova. So in order to multiply, they needed to make the sexual contact or to extract the sperm from the sexual masculine glands and to place them into the ova of the feminine sexual organs. Since they were uh new, related with the sexual knowledge, they were instructed by the Elohim 
This Elohim, of course, were not only physical but internal. And they were seeing them. It's not like we in this uh, epoch, we don't see physically, or we can see physically, of course, uh, a master, but not internal. Because we need to develop the inner senses in order to see the inner being of any creature or of any animal. But at that time, Lemurians were having, of course, 12 senses. The seven chakras were fully developed. And through these senses, they were uh, not only seeing the Elohim of this planet Earth, but they were capable of uh, seeing the Elohim of other planets, humanities of other planets, of this solar system and other solar systems. Senses that for us are for, uh, incredible, for them were just something normal. So, to their senses, physically and internal, they were guided by the Elohim, by the archangels, by the angels. So they knew how to perform the sexual act under the command of this Elohim which the Bible refers as Jehovah Elohim. So this Jehovah Elohim is not one, but many entities, master monads that were guiding that humanity. And uh, the sexual act was performed in the temples, never in home. At that time, of course, humanity didn't have uh, that that we call lust, cupidity, or sexual degeneration. So they performed a sexual act (coughs) under the guidance of this Elohim, as we call in this uh, day and age, white Tantrism, or white tantra. Men and women were united in the temples, and they didn't uh, uh, reach the orgasm, because uh, the Lemurians knew that only the animals of the kingdom reached the spasm of the orgasm Because they are guided by the instinct. They have not intellect or reasoning. In order to comprehend that is, of course, a fault. Or something that they shouldn't do. But since the Lemurians had the reasoning, or objective reasoning, they knew how to perform it. So their children were being born without pain. They didn't were slaves of sexual desire. They didn't have desire at that time. But of course, as you know, as we explain in different lectures, one day, infected by the Luciferian vibrations of nature of certain elements they were uh, tempted to perform the sexual act out of the temples and without the guidance of the Elohim tempted by the tempting serpent, they said, of Eden. That tempting serpent was not outside, but inside. It's called the Luciferian vibration. And of course, 
they reach the spasm or the orgasm because they couldn't control that uh, serpent that was, of course, circulating in their physical body at that time when it was tempted. The lure of the serpent was within, as we always find it within. The outcome of that, of course, was the loss of the powers. Since Jehovah Elohim said, My spirit will not remain within the man forever. In this way, we'll say that the Elohim knew that sooner or later, humanity was going to fall into the scene of orgasm or spasm. Animal sexual spasm. That, of course, is a way in which we learn in white tantrism how to perform the sexual act without a spasm, without the orgasm. That's white tantrism. The way in which the couple control the sexual force in order to develop objective reasoning, in order to develop their brain. And have the power of controlling their sexual seed in order to bring creatures into the world without committing the crime of reaching the orgasm or spasm of the animals. But of course, that humanity that didn't have too much knowledge of what the Bible called good and evil were tempted by that energy or the tree of life of good and evil, which is a reference to the sexual organ. And tempted by children or by having child or children by their own, they uh, couldn't uh, uh, take the man, one sperm, as they did it before, with the power of the Holy Spirit, but they took millions in order to engender a creature, which that's precisely the sin against the Holy Ghost, which is called fornication. Because as I said, the animal level, the animals spill the semen because they are instinctual. They don't reason. They don't have intellect. They don't know what is good or what is right and what is wrong. But we, with reasoning, we know what is right and what is wrong. And in order to take one sperm from our sexual glands and to engender a child into a woman, we need a power superior to the mind. And that power is the power of Kundalini in Sanskrit. Or what the Bible calls the power of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit of Kundalini is a sexual power. That that humanity control at that time. So the Elohim or their interior Elohim, Monad, were capable of taking one sperm from the physical organ of the man and engender the female in the sexual act without orgasm. That's a power. Still, the female retained that capacity where he, uh, where she, of course, uh, releases one of them every month or every other month. That power, of course, is instinctual now in, in, in women. But at that time, in Lemuria, was a control power. The woman had the power to release one of them, and the man had the power to release one sperm. That power is called the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Spirit, which, of course, stands in the spinal column. Spinal column is where the Holy Spirit stands and works with the seven senses of the soul. So when the Holy Spirit, as energy, stands from the coccyx to the brain, all the seven chakras are in activity. And through those chakras is how the Holy Spirit controls the physical body and 
the human soul has the power of releasing one's sperm without orgasm. But when at that time they committed the crime of eating from the fruit of the tree of good and evil, the tree of knowledge, which is sexuality, they lost that power. Because the power that sustained that fire in the spinal column is a sexual akasha in the sexual organs. So when that sexual zemen, akasha, that seed is ejaculated, in this way, we will say the millions of seeds are ejaculated, then the fire descends because there is no more substance to retain or to sustain that fire in the spinal column. And that's why it's written that Jehovah Elohim said to the couples, the day when you reach the orgasm or the spasm of the animals or when you eat from the fruit of tree of knowledge, you will die. Meaning, you will die to the spirit and you will born as a beast. And that was happened at that epoch in the Lemuria. By eating from the forbidden fruit, by eating the fruit as the animals do it, they lost the fire. And by losing the fire in the spinal column, the Kundalini, the Holy Ghost, they lost the inner senses. And the power of creating without orgasm. And the outcome was that we're creating like the animals. So since that epoch, humanity is creating that, like the animals. You see, if you observe a dog, a horse, a bull, a donkey, they fornicate in order to multiply. And if you observe the intellectual animal of this epoch, they do the same in order to multiply. There's no difference. Well, the difference might be that these creatures of the animal kingdom do it uh, once in a while when they are... Uh, we will say uh, <coughs> with the lure of the sexual act when they are excited to do it which is every other week or every other season we will say while we do it uh, every time, every day just for fun that will be the difference right now so as we explained in other lectures, that was precisely the crime of that humanity. And we said that humanity because they were really humans. This is what is written there, symbolically in other verse of the Bible, that the Beni Elohim, or the children of the Elohim, when they saw that the women were beautiful, they took wives from the women of men and they fornicated with them. And they created children. So this is precisely what we have to understand as the Beni Elohim or the children of God. Because the children of God is also a reference to the Bodhisattvas that were, of course, vehicles of great masters of the past. In the book of Enoch, it is written that, symbolically of course, that about the 200 Beni Elohim or children of God that fornicated at that time and fell. With that, of course, was a big mistake. That Lemurian race fell into animal generation. Before that, humanity was multiplying to human generation which is white Tantra. And when the fall of humanity, or, that, or the Lemurian humanity, into animal generation, the black magicians, Luciferians, of other epochs, <coughs> start teaching black Tantra. Or the way in which the human being acquire powers through fornication. 
without, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit, but the opposite. And that was precisely the great mistake, a great trouble at that epoch. It is stated symbolically in the book of Revelation, uh, I mean in the book of Genesis, that uh, at that time when humanity still knew about white tantra, he says that Adam knew his wife and she begat Cain. That Cain, of course, translated into English from Hebrew means smith, a direct relation to alchemy. So the alchemist of Lemuria, by the guidance of the Elohim, were developing objective reasoning. Cain, the mind, or solar mind, was created in the positive way. And of course, through alchemy also, it is stated that Adam and Eve had another son, which was Habel, or Abel. The human soul was developed through white tantra. But, as we said, with the time, with the pass of time, when that humanity, Adam and Eve, fell into fornication, into animal generation, their mind became polluted. That mind is Cain. And then it says that Cain rose against Hebel, the human soul, and slew him. Of course, we have to state that this statement written in the book of Genesis should be interpreted that Cain rose against Hebel in the field of Yesod. Because they said that being in the field, Cain killed Abel. That field that is talking there clearly in the book of Genesis is a, sephira, a reference to the Sephira Yesod, the sexual act. It means that when that humanity, Adam and Eve, fornicated, and the moment when they fornicated, their own particular individual Cain, that mind, kill their own soul. This is how we have to comprehend and to understand the mystery of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve, as we explain in the gate to Eden, has many symbols. First, is referred to Lemuria, the root race. Second, this is a reference to Ida Pingala in the physical body. And third, it's also a reference to the brain and to the sex. So when we talk about Adam and Eve, we have to read it in that way. And when we read that Adam and Eve had a first son, Cain, we have to understand that that is a reference to the mind, which is the outcome of alchemy. But that mind, Cain, that in the beginning was precisely uh, the outcome of white tantra, became black with the sexual ejaculation. And this is precisely the moment in which Cain turns against Abel, which is the human soul, and kills it, or kills him. That occurs inside. It's a psychological statement. And of course, now we see in the general statement, in the global statement, we see Cain and Abel, the outcome of that hermaphroditism, which is a division of that Lemurian race into black tantrism and white tantrism. That's why we refer that uh, 
uh, the uh, as Cain and Abel we said the hermaphrodite separatist Cain and Abel the hermaphrodite separatist means that separated the psyche in two ways and that, that happened of course in the fourth sub race and the beginning of the fifth root race don't fall into the mistake of thinking, oh yeah, Adam and Eve was one couple and had two children, Cain and Abel. But that's just a very literal interpretation of that uh, alchemical book of Genesis. It's a symbol. Right? When you read Cain and Abel, you have to refer to inside, to the psyche, immediately. Cain, the mind, Abel, the, the soul. That's how you have to interpret it. <coughs> and of course, the soul dies, Abel. And it, because it's synced into the clipothic levels of nature. The soul dies for the spirit and is born from hell. Or for hell, in other words. And Cain takes over, but fallen. That happened at Lemurian state. So it is written in the book of the Master Samuel Veor and many other masters that this mistake was trying to be resolved by the cosmo creators, archangels that came from other planets. Because indeed, this planet Earth, this humanity, is the outcome of the intervention of other humanities of other planets, as other planets are the inter have the intervention of other humanities. Do not think that this planet is exclusive and we don't have a relation or interrelationship with extraterrestrials. We always had it. Because in the time of the first root race, the second root race, and the third root race, those humanities were in contact with humanities of Mercury, of Venus, of Mars, and all the planets of the solar system, in all dimensions, and other solar systems of this galaxy, and other galaxies. So the problem that happened in this planet Earth, of course, was related with karma of previous cosmic days. And when these cosmo creators, archangels, from other planets came here in order to resolve and help this humanity, as we will do in this epoch, when we see in Africa, for instance, that they are starving to death, and there are groups of this uh, uh, country of America or, or other countries of Europe that go and assist them. And there are uh, people from other countries of the same planet, so in the same way, in other planets. There was no big deal to come in cosmic ships and trying to help this humanity. So they did it. And uh, at that time, the Elohim started to resolve this. And they, of course, helped them by eliminating, as you know, the Kundabafer organ that was developed in the excessive way. And they start organizing groups in order to guide this humanity, the Lemurian humanity, and to raise that humanity up from the animal generation. <coughs> and this is how it's written in the book of Revelation, uh, excuse me, book of Genesis, that Adam knew his wife Eve again, and she engendered a third son called Seth. And here is precisely the meaning of Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. Seth is the outcome of the fallen. After knowing all this problem in Lemuria, they rose again into white tantra. And that is Seth. Which is the third aspect. 
But of course, not all of the Lemurians enter into the white tantrism. Because remember that Cain also is written there in the book of Genesis that Cain, after the fall, he found his wife and multiplied. So when you read the book of Genesis, you find that Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve, the Lemurian root race, Adam and Eve, they had Seth. And Seth has another son who he named Enoch. This word Enoch is a, a reference translated as illuminated or seer. That means that when the Lemurians were entering again into the white tantra, they gained, of course, knowledge of good and evil because they fell. When they rose again, they were developing that that is called Seth. That's why Seth is in relation with the Kundalini rising in the spinal column, but with knowledge of good and evil. Seth is a, is a symbol in the Egyptian uh, mythology about that energy that rises. It has two uh, symbolism. First is Seth related with the ego and the red devils of Seth. And the other aspect is a positive aspect which is uh, written in the Bible. The second aspect is that uh, related with the reading in the Bible of Seth as a risen fire in the spinal column given birth to entities, human beings that know good and evil. And that happened in Lemuria. Matthew Samael refers, for instance, that at that epoch, he fell among the Beni Elohim, but he rose again in the same Lemuria and formed that group that called Seth. Now, listen carefully. Seth, of course, was at the very end of the outcome, at the very end of the Lemurian epoch, where those... Uh, Individuals were the seed, the seed race for the next root race that was the Atlantean race. So Seth is the origin of the Atlantean civilization. But not only Seth, but also Cain. We have two, the, the, the two divisions. Because Cain also is written there when he finds his wife, he has a son. And the name of that son is Enoch. Of course, sometimes uh, Kabbalists mislead the reader. And instead of Enoch, they wrote Enos. But it's the same. Meaning, it is showing that that Enos, the difference of that letter, is showing that was also a seer. But not seer of the divine, but seer of klipoth. It's what you find in this day and age. Two ways of seeing. When you awake your consciousness in a positive way, you start seeing in all the levels of the tree of life. But when you awake your consciousness with, uh, through black tantra, drugs like LSD, cocaine, heroin, and all drugs, drugs that are common in this day and age, you also become a seer. You see other, other dimensions, but not higher, but clipothic, inferior, or infernal, as we say, hell. So there are two ways to awake, up and down. And that's the difference between Seth and Cain. Because remember that it's written there that Seth was a restitution of Abel that Cain killed. Meaning that that self is the consciousness risen or rising, you would say, in the psyche of those 
white tantric Lemurians, but with more knowledge of good and evil. And uh, this is how the terrestrial epoch started, unfortunately, in our planet Earth. This is the beginning of the terrestrial epoch, three-dimensionally speaking, in which the whole planet crystallized in a three-dimensional world, but with two uh, divisions, white tantra and black tantra. So the Atlantean civilization had uh, uh, seven sub-races. And we find that uh, the first Atlantean sub-race was formed by the Mohals. Mohals. This is how it's written in R M O A H A L S Mohals. <coughs> These uh, Atlanteans, of course, were the Atlanteans of the first uh, root race. I mean, the first sub race of the Atlantean civilization that live in the golden age the new white tantra but of course many remnants from the Lemurian epoch that were practicing black tantrism in the bible called Cain were also living in different areas of that new born continent that was uh, really the first manifestation of the terrestrial epoch. And uh, the second uh, sub-race was formed by the Tlavatlis. T-L-A-V-A-T-L-I-S. The Tlavatis. Which were also uh, living still in the golden age and the beginning of the Silver Age, of the Atlantean Epoch. Individuals that were in communication with uh, other civilizations of other planets. And they uh, developed, as uh, the Lemurians developed, a uh, great civilization with cosmic ships that were traveling in the space, utilizing atomic energy. The third... Uh, sub-race of the Atlantean civilization were called the Toltecs, which still are remembered in Mexico. The Toltecs that were guided by Quetzalcoatl, or those great uh, masters of the past. Toltecs means the builders. As Mason means also builders. Unfortunately, that was precisely at the end of uh, the Silver Age of the Atlantean civilization. At the end of the third sub-race where the Toltecas appear, where the fourth sub-race started, the Turanians, precisely is where the black magicians start to develop and to be bigger and enlarge their groups in the Atlantean civilization. The Turanians were black magicians. And since nature always gives opportunity to those fallen souls in order to rise again and to develop as uh, true human beings, the Turanians, of course, were still uh, practicing the black magic from the Lemurian epoch and developing witchcraft and black tantrism, sorcery. And these uh, black magicians, witches and sorcerers of that epoch, the Turanians, were uh, developing uh, very negative powers. And they were, of course, controlling the animal kingdom, plant kingdom, not only physically, but internally, because they could see 
the elementals of nature. And they were utilizing witch, witchcraft, sorcery, in order to manipulate the masses, the human masses, and to conquer them. So at that time, they were worshipping the entities of darkness, demons of Klippoth, fallen angels of past cosmic days, of these days, and uh, demons that, as Belzebub, of course, were practicing black tantra and were uh, looking for proselytes. These demons were worshipped as gods by the Turanians. And here is precisely when we find uh, in the book of Genesis, in the chapter 6, verse 1 to 13, that is written. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and that daughters were born unto them, that the Beni Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they choose and fornicate. They said, and Jehovah said, my spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants. Lemurians, Nephilim, in that earth, in those days. Of course, it is written there <coughs> that Jehovah said that he saw that the weakness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is refer a reference to the Turanians or the fourth sub-race of the Atlantean epoch. And Jehovah repented that he had made men on the earth and, he, and it grieved him in his heart. And Jehovah said, I will destroy men whom I have created from the face of the earth, both men and beast, and the creeping thing and the folds of the earth, for it repented me that I have made them. So for that situation came in the fourth sub-race. Because at that time in the Atlantean civilization, everywhere in that continent was witchcraft, black magic. And men were enjoying more developing the powers of darkness. And nobody wanted to repent or to change. And the whole earth was polluted. And that's what the outcome of Cain, or black tantrism, that began in the epoch of Lemuria. So then it was said there that Elohim saw that Noah was good. That Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah. So this Noah, of course, is a reference to that uh, what uh, in, the, in India is called the Manu Vaisvasvata, the men, children of the sun, or the child of the sun, or with the solar mind. Reference to those initiates that in that epoch of the Turanians were practicing white tantra. And of course, Noah is also a reference to the atom nous that is always in the heart of anybody. So of course, if the Elohim look in us as we are right now or as they were in the epoch of the Turanians or the Atlantean civilization, then we find that the only good thing that we have within is the atom nous. Because the atom nous in the left ventricle of the heart is the atom that is always in contact with the Christic forces, with the monad, with the Elohim. And through that is how we can build the human being if we repent. And we annihilate the ego. That atom nous develops and guides us. This is how the Elohim guides us in order to rise again as true human beings. That is a reference to Noah, as the Bible talks about. 
And of course, it is written that Noah had three sons. This, these are the generation of Noah. Noah was a just man, or man, manas, nus, and perfect in his generations. When it says perfect in his generation, this that the way that they were generating themselves were not like animals. Do you understand that? Perfect in his generation means that they are not generating animals, fornication. That they know white tantra. And, of course, when you, white, uh, you know white tantra, then you developed a walk with the Elohim. Because it says that Noah walked with God. But the right word is Elohim. means that he walked with white tantra with the Elohim. And Noah begat three sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Astral body, mental body, and causal body. This is how we had to deal with the atom news. The three children of Noah as a reference to our inner bodies that we had to build. And of course, cosmic is speaking in the Atlantean epoch, it is said that Noah is a, a, a representative of those individuals that were practicing white tantra and that knew the mystery of the arcana or the arcanum AZF which the Bible refers as the Ark of Noah. It says you have to build an ark. That ark is not a ship of wood as many people think. That is still they are looking for that ark. That ark is a reference to the mysteries of Da'at. That, that uh, Noah and his followers were teaching at that time. So they build the ark means they build the great uh, army of people. And they were prohibited to mix with the Turanians because they were really evil black magicians. Or as the Bible says, to multiply with them. So therefore, these white tantric people were the selected ones that crossed themselves with the Hyperboreans. At that time, the Hyperboreans in the Atlantean civilization were the second root race, crystallized physically, and they were vehicles of gods. So these Hyperboreans, physically speaking, came with those uh, people of Noah, and through white tantra, they multiply and create the Shemites. The Shemites is the fifth sub-race of the Atlantean civilization. But it's the outcome of the cross of the fourth, which were white tantra, with the Hyperboreans, not with the Turanians. Okay, the Turanians were going to be destroyed for their evilness. Of course, they were multiplying more and more, and that's why it was written there, that the Shemites were prohibited to multiply with those sub-races that came after the Turanians that were plotted in black magic in order not, not to contaminate themselves with uh, black tantra. This is how you understand the forbidden of uh, the cross of other races in the Atlantean civilization. Of course, from the Shemites, came Ham and Japheth, cosmically speaking, the other subsequent sub-races. Ham was the sixth, and Japheth, the seventh. That was the outcome of the White Tantra. Of course, uh, they are also referred as uh, the fifth the, the six are the Akkadians. The Akkadians were the sixth, which uh, is also written in many books. And the Mongolians were the seventh. 
You see, still that uh, sub race exists in Asia. But the Mongolians were the outcome of the seven sub race of the Atlantean civilization, of course, at that epoch. And that's why when Noah came out of uh, Atlantis, they established themselves in the Gobi Desert. And that Gobi Desert is precisely the beginning of our present Aryan root race. So that is the story of our, our present Aryan root race. <coughs> of course, the Shemites, Ham and Japheth, and all those subsequent uh, crossing of the, that white tantrism, studied in Sam's in the Gobi Desert, where the Mongolians. And there, they established, of course, the basis of our present civilization or root race, which is called the Aryan race. But also, the remnants of the Turanians were also escaping, because those were precisely the beings that were destroyed by the universal flood in order to clean the earth of evilness. But they remained and the white uh, lodge was fighting against them, and finally they were destroyed completely. That statement or that story is written in the book of Exodus by Moses. When Moses came out from Egypt, it's a reference to Mazarim, as we said in many other lectures, that was Atlantis at that epoch. Coming out of Mazarin in order to establish themselves in the promised land, the new lands that were given origin to this root race, the Aryan root race. So after the universal flood and after the Turanians were destroyed completely, then the golden age of our present root race started in Tibet. With the crossing, of course, of those uh, Hyperboreans with the Atlanteans. And uh, at that time, the prohibition of not crossing yourself with other races, the Shemites, of course, said this is the end. Now you can cross themselves with other races of the European continent, in Asian continent, in order to give birth to the Aryan race. So that prohibition of the Shemites of not crossing themselves with other races was only in the Atlantean epoch. But in the beginning of the Aryan root race, that prohibition was uh, cancelled. And this is how the uh, Aryan race established uh, themselves in this uh, continents that we know now in the planet Earth. Many civilizations and great uh, cities, wisdom, uh, existed in Tibet. And from Tibet, the people established in India and in China the second sub race of our present Aryan race. That was the Golden Age. This is where you find the story in the past of great civilizations great kings, great masters that existed at that epoch. And from, the, from China and India, the immigration of people into Chaldea, into Egypt, Babylon, uh, the Iranian civilization that you call also the I forget about the Iranians, the Iraq civilization, the Babylonians, and the Iranians are Persian. the Persian. Yeah. The Persian civilization and the Babylonian civilization is the third sub race. Jerusalem also existed at that epoch. It was the silver epoch or the beginning of the copper age of our present root race. But of course, as you know, 
the Aryan civilization started to develop the Iron Age, the Kali Yuga, in the epoch of the Romans and Greeks. Because Romans and Greeks, the Roman and Greek uh, civilizations, were the fourth, or are the fourth outcome of the fourth sub-race of this Aryan civilization. And that epoch is where the Master Jesus of Nazareth came into the earth physically in order to finish his mission to help, of course, these monads that were entangled in too much karma, as you know. But uh, from the Greek and Romans, or the fourth sub-race, the fifth sub-race developed among the Anglos and Saxons, Teutons, English, French, Germans, Polish, Russians, and all of those races related with the Teutonic, Anglo-Saxon in Europe. And developed civ uh, great uh, uh, civilization. Unfortunately, at the very end, uh, they uh, launched themselves into the First and Second World War in this present Aryan race. Still people think that uh, Teutons, Anglo-Saxons, are only the Aryans. They know that they are only the fifth Aryan sub-race of this great civilization. Because uh, Christopher Columbus brought all of the European people into the lands of America. As you know, here in America, were the remnants of the Atlantean civilization as well, living in this continent. And uh, the Europeans crossed themselves, especially the Spanish from Spain, with the natives of America, in order to originate the sixth sub-race of this present Aryan race. Still people think that the sixth sub-race is going to be formed. They ignore that the sixth sub-race, the Aryan race, existed in Latin America. That's why we always uh, state, we emphasize that we are at the very end of our present root race, Aryan race. Because the last, which is the seventh sub-race of our present root race, is being formed in the United States and Canada. Which is a mixture of all the races. <coughs> so the seventh sub-race of the Aryan race is a mixture of all the races from all the continents. That's why you find here in New York, or in, or in Toronto, or in any country or state of the Union, different races. Because the seventh sub race is being formed. And that's why the Elohim, or the White Lodge, as we would call, is uh, preoccupied with the making of the sixth root race that will become after the destruction of this Aryan race that will be destroyed as the Turanians and the Atlantean civilization were destroyed because they were degenerated and practicing Black Tantra. Here, of course, the degeneration is worse because uh, as you know, as you observe, this humanity is being degenerated more and more and everybody is applauding degeneration and accepting degeneration. And uh, they want to form a new civilization, a new golden age with rotten seed. That is impossible. That's why the Elohim, the masters, when seeing that most of the seed, the human seed of this Aryan race is polluted, they want to form now the future sixth root race. 
with a mixture of terrestrials with extraterrestrials. Because when you investigate the human seed of this civilization, you find that really is not good. Because people are really uh, delivering themselves to fornication and sexual degeneration, to the use of drugs, not only drugs that like cocaine, heroin, marijuana, and all of those drugs that altered the sexual genes, but also the drugs that are being popular in medicine, that are also altering the glands of the physical organism and originate a human seed very degenerated. So the Elohim or the masters of the White Lodge are preoccupied because there is no good seed in order to form a new uh, root race after the great cataclysm that is approaching. That's why many human beings in this epoch are being selected in order to be crossed with people of other planets in order to form the sixth root race. So the sixth root race will be the outcome of extraterrestrials with terrestrials. Of course, still people think that there is not extraterrestrials. There is no people from other planets. But that civilization or that future root race is not going to be built with beliefs, but with sexual seed. They exist. Personally, I am in contact with them, and I know that they exist. Not because I read it or because somebody told me, but my own experience. And I don't care if the people believe me or not. Because that is not the objective of Gnosis. To believe. You have to experience that. For me, extraterrestrial is something normal. As I know that people exist in Europe and in Asia. I live in America. But I know that people exist also in Africa. So when I put myself in the planet Earth, I know very well by direct experience, that people exist in other planets. Not because I read it or because I believe in it, but because I have direct experience with it. Of course, those people are interested in being in contact with people that want to change. It will be stupid if you see a drunkard or a drug addict walking in the streets and you open the doors and say, Welcome to my home. Can you give me drugs? Right? Of course, that's, that's, that's not the way. So, the extraterrestrials look for people that really want to change. The people really that are changing. And then you be in contact with them. So, we have to open the doors and know to invite good, good persons, good people into our homes. So, that's precisely what is happening in this day and age. Many people believe in extraterrestrials. Many people do not believe, but Gnostics, we don't believe or disbelieve. We experience. And we know that eventually that one that is serious in himself, working psychologically, eventually is in contact with them. No big deal. And that's why we are talking always with security and knowing what we, what we know. And inviting people to know this. This is the story of the earth. A new root race is coming which people talk about the golden age. But golden age that is coming is not going to be formed by, with prostitutes, with homosexuals, with lesbians, with thieves, with drug addicts, with assassins, with pedophiles. The new civilization, the new root race that is coming is going to be formed with clean people that we clean physically and psychologically. And we need to be clean because all of us are filthy. That's why we are teaching this. If we want to be chosen, we have to choose ourselves. It's not a matter of believing in something. It's a matter of practicing white tantra and meditation in order to annihilate the evil. Because the earth, as it is right now in the terrestrial epoch, has to give birth. Another two root races. Because we are the fifth. The Aryan race. Remember, the protoplasmic was the first, the hyperborean was the second, the Lemurian was the third, the Atlantis, or the Atlantean, were the fourth. We are the fifth, the Aryans. The sixth is named Koradi, K-O-R-A-D-I, the Koradi root race. It's a future root race. 
after the destruction of this one. But we have to make the seed in order to create that. And this is our mission. After the karate, the seventh will come. And the planet will become ethereal and more ethereal little by little. Do you have questions? Um, I know Kumbo Buffa was uh, administered uh, or common to the planet, right? Now, was it that at the same time when the sexes were divided in Lemuria that the Kumbo Buffa was implanted at the same time? Yes, the question is, was the Kundabafa implanted in Lemuria at the same time that the sexes were divided? Of course. The Kundabafa cannot develop if the sexes are not separated. Because the Kundabafa or the Kundalini develops <coughs> or evolves when the sexes are separated. The human being, the Mona, needs to have separated sexes and only to bring through the sexual act the necessary elements that need to develop inside the psyche through white tantrism. That's why the necessity of the division of sexes. In other words, if we as elemental animals inherit a hermaphrodite physical body, we cannot develop there because we need to put in activity the fire. So therefore, the elementals that come from the animal kingdom need also that division in order to perform the sexual act and bring through that fire to that furnace of the sexual act the elements of nature and the cosmos to build inside a human being, the internal bodies. And that's why the necessity of the division of sexes. But of course, that's the problem. When division of sexes happened, if you reach the orgasm, Instead of developing a kundalini, you develop the kundabhafa, which is the opposite. And then you sink into klipath, into hell. And that's precisely the problem in Lemuria. When they were in the beginning divided in sexes, they were guided by the Elohim. But one day they felt tempted to perform the sexual act without the guidance of the Elohim, and the outcome was the orgasm. So they lost everything, and after that, they rose again as Seth. How much more temptation was it that the Kumbh Bokka was left in too long by the God that was responsible for administering it? The thing is that the Kunda Bafir was also necessary in order to establish uh, or give a stabilization to the layers of the earth. And uh, at that time, the Kunda Bafir was uh, uh, left for a certain period in order to take it out again and to build human beings and to stabilize the inner layers of the earth. The problem is that the calculation that these cosmocrators made at that time was bad, was wrong. They came late. And when they came, there were another psychological nature created within the psyche, within the soul of those humans which we call Cain, or what the Bible called Cain. So after that, when Cain killed Abel, that's precisely the big mistake. Because Cain shouldn't kill Abel. I mean, Cain shouldn't kill Abel. But unfortunately it happened, because the Kundabafa organ developed an ego very strong, a mind, a Cain, so strong, that completely disappeared the soul. Eliminated the soul from, from nature. And that was precisely the problem. Because when Cain is born or Black Tantra is, is happening and the Kundabafa is developed, if the Cosmocrators come at the right time, the soul is still alive and develops as a true human being with knowledge of good and evil. But the problem is that when they came back, Cain already killed Abel. I mean that the mind was completely so strong. And since that time, the Elohim are trying to fix this problem. As you know, still, we are trying. At the beginning of the Aryan race, you seem to indicate that those who survived from Atlantis were permitted, were permitted to cross with those from other races. But how could those from other races exist if everyone else was wiped out by the flood? 
not all of them were wiped. That's precisely the problem, or people mistaken problem. They think that when the universal flood or when some destruction comes, everybody is destroyed. No. Sometimes degenerated people survive. Remember the cavemen. Those cavemen that scientists in this epoch of anthropology discover in different places are just remnants from Lemuria and sometimes remnants from Atlantis. Degenerated people that survived the destructions and that they were living like savages. While the others that were selected to white tantra were forming the golden age. The others were isolated in other parts of the world. And after that they multiply. So all those savages that you find in this epoch from different continents are just degenerated Atlanteans. And before that, degenerated Lemurians. So most of them are destroyed. But those that are not black magicians, that are not black tantric people, they are not so dangerous. They're just animals, intellectual animals that are there. But eventually they multiply. How much ego do other humanities usually have? As much, 10%. But to develop 97%, it's pretty obvious that Cain killed Abel there. You know? But 10% still Abel is alive. You know? Remember that Abel was always doing sacrifices of the, of the best of the sheep for their inner God. That's white tantra, the symbol of white tantra. But when Cain killed Abel, no more white tantra, no more sacrifices of sheep. Only sacrifices of the earth, sacrificing the, the, the physical planet or the physical body for nothing. Just for the physical satisfaction of the senses. Marco Dites, when you said that uh, gave birth to the calf, is that a symbol or is that just an uh, actual... Hermaphrodites that were uh, given birth to the calf, well, uh, it's better said androgynous. Androgynous. You know, the word androgynous is andros from Greek, which means man. And genica, which means woman. So androgynous means men, woman, together. But it's refer a reference to the sexual, feminine, and masculine forces in a body, not necessarily in the sexual organs. So at that time, the hyperborean is written that they were multiplying through the calves. Like, uh, like the plants by sprouting, but because they were androgynous, having the two polarities, the power of multiplying themselves in that way. But the Lemurians, they were hermaphrodites, Hermes, the mind, represented in the ancient times with uh, a man with a phallus in a state of erection. There's a statue that said that is uh, represented like that, Hermes, and written in the phallus, giver of reasoning. So that is a reference to the masculine organ. And of course, Aphrodite is a reference to the feminine organ. Remember that there are many elements that are called aphrodisiacs in order to increase the sexual force in the sexual organs, the sexual lure, anxiety. So hermaphrodite is a reference to a physical sexual organs, masculine and feminine. So the Lemurians were the ones that were having the uh, sexual organs developed, as we know right now. But in the past, they were androgynous, having the same powers, but not necessarily showing the sexual organs. Because that power can develop in different organisms. There are many plants that are androgynous. Even microbes, that are, are they multiply by themselves. If they don't show sexual organs as we have them now. But what we call a hermaphrodite, it means sexual organs that we have not physically. And with the separation of sexes, they developed. The phallus developed in the man, in the vagina, in the woman. So, and, and we'll move, we'll move the beginning. Since they were perfect human beings, was there evil? Was there hell? Was there demons? Of course. The process of falling eventually led to demons and to ego and to pride and to jealousy and the, that all multiplied or there was always... 
In the Lemurian, uh, the question is, in the Lemurian epoch, oh, they were perfect human beings or they were also evil beings, right? Remember that uh, they were also black magicians, demons from past cosmic days, looking for proselytes. Of course, the Lemurians in the beginning were naive. We said naive. They didn't know good and evil. But they, of course, were practicing white tantra. When they fell for the temptation of their own sexual force, then the demons, black magicians, saw the opportunity to teach them and to have them as proselytes. And that's what happened. When the cosmo creators came back, the black lodge was really controlling the planet. Cain killed Abel. And they were trying to help the souls, of course. But then, after the fall, and with the practice of black tantra, the ego developed terribly. Why does the, uh, the white did the greater kingdom have to be an arcanum, a secret? Why does it have to be veiled? Well, uh, in the Lemurian epoch, that was not a secret. But they needed to be guided, of course, in order to know how to do it. To be guided internally, right? In the Atlantean epoch, it was not that secret like in this epoch. And this epoch is a secret because too much is the generation. And the masters uh, in the beginning of this uh, Aryan root race, to those that didn't know the Arcanum, they were demanding from them the annihilation at least of the 50% of the ego in order to start practicing alchemy and to develop. Because they didn't want to commit the same mistake at the time of Atlantis. You know, the Turanians were practicing black tantrism with ego and developing that. They didn't, want, they didn't want that. And that's why they keep in secrecy that in secrecy. So in past times, you need to awake your consciousness first in order to receive the great arcana. That's why it is written that any single person, if he keeps chastity uh, as a single, celibacy, and know how to transmute with pranayamas, any person can awake 50% as much. Beyond that is not possible. They need to practice Tantra. But why are we teaching Tantra then? Because there is no time to wait for people to awake 50%. If there were time, we will teach now how to awake and as other, other religions did, like Buddhism, etc., and to demand them to awaken, and they really beautiful do it. But there is no time now. See nature. Destruction is advancing very fast. If you wait for the people to awake first in order to teach them the arcana, everything will be lost. So that's why this is precisely what the White Lodge is giving. The arcana very fast in order to uh, everybody for himself. You know. Do you have more questions? How long? Well, it depends how, how much they degenerate. Could be in one life. Hmm? How long a human being uh, endures in order to develop 97% of the ego? 97% of the ego. Yeah. So it takes uh, as much as they degenerate themselves. In one life, of, of course, you can generate yourself completely with, with black tantra and to develop 100% of your ego. Because a black magician is somebody that... You see, this is something very important here about a, what is a black magician. One time I was talking with the master Samael Omveor and asked him that question. What is the difference between a white and a, and a black master? Because both of them are awakened. Well, says the master. They are awakened, but not in the same way. The white magician disintegrates the ego. And they weigh the conscience positively. But the black use their willpower in order to integrate the ego. You understand that? He asked me. He said, what do you mean to integrate? You take snow and then you press the snow and you integrate it and you make a ball. That's a black magician. They integrate all the ego 
you know, lust, anger, pride, vanity, and all that that is evil in you, you integrate it in one. What do you have when you integrate the ego? You have a demon. Somebody that utilizes the whole thing and awakes within it. That's a demon. Well, a white magician is different. The consciousness is completely liberated, disintegrated. Well, the black magician is integrating. Uh, this is what they say. Oh, we, are, we take more and more and more and more and more and bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? This is the black tantra or the black Kabbalist that take and take and take, receive and receive and receive more negativity and learn to be negative. Black. No more le- uh, questions. Thank you very much. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.